So everyone can mute themselves now. Hello everyone, and welcome to this IDS event on global perspectives on countering backlash against women in politics. We've got some excellent speakers joining us today to talk about this. Um, unfortunately, Mandu Reid has been unable to join us, but we're really pleased to be able to welcome Hannah Barron Brown, who's Deputy Leader for Women's Equality Party. Um, we don't have much time, so I'm going to swiftly hand over to our chair for the next hour who is Liz Ford, a Deputy Editor for Global Development at The Guardian. But thank you, Liz. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Just really thank you for inviting me to chair this panel. It's such a, an interesting subject, and it's a subject that I've been um, really interested in since doing some research in Sierra Leone on this very issue about political spaces and backlash, which is a few years ago. So I'm very excited to hear from our panellists. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, I think everyone should be on mute, um, but unless you're speaking, of course, um, if you could stay on mute. And it'll be great to get some questions. Please post questions as we go along um, in the Zoom chat. That'll be brilliant. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel and then I'm going to ask each of the panellists a bit of a scene setting question. And then we'll come to um, questions from the audience after that, if that's OK. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure to um, introduce the panel for today. Um, we have Aisha Khan, to um, start off with, who has been part of the Collective for Social Science Research since 2001. Um, her work particularly focuses on gender and development, social policy and conflict and refugee issues in Pakistan. We've got uh, Sahela Nazneen, who is a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies. Her research focuses on gender and politics, feminist movements, women's empowerment and violence against women in particularly in South Asia, Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Hannah Byron brown um, who is the deputy leader of the Women's Equality Party in the UK, where she has a portfolio for Making Change Happen, which is a brilliant portfolio. Um, she's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and works to support people particularly with disabilities. And finally, we have Teresa Sachete, who is Professor on the Graduate Programme in Interdisciplinary Studies on Women, Gender and Feminisms at the, Federal, at the Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. And her research includes, amongst many things, women's political representation and gender quotas. So I'm going to come to you, Aisha, first. Now you've co-authored a book called Women Politicians Navigating the Hostile Environment in Pakistan, which says a lot about the situation in the country. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what that hostile environment is like, particularly for female politicians in Pakistan. You know, are women encouraged to seek political office and what obstacles do they face? 
Okay, thank you, Liz, um, and uh, thank you to IDS for inviting me to be here today. Um, so I put together a few thoughts to answer your question. And um, the first I thought I would begin by telling you the good things, which is that, um, yes, you know, we have high profile women in politics in Pakistan, as some of you may know, Benazir Bhutto was twice prime minister. But of course, she was the daughter of a former prime minister um, who himself was executed. And the fact that Benazir was assassinated in 2007 by Taliban militants tells you a great deal about the dangers women face when they seek leadership positions here. Now, of course, the most encouraging development in recent history took place in uh, 2002, when after a long campaign, the women's movement succeeded in building consensus and getting a quota for reserved seats for women in all elected bodies. Now, it wasn't the 33% that they were asking for, it was 17%, but nonetheless, um, it changed the dynamics of legislative processes. So now we have caucuses and all the assemblies in Pakistan, we, which have actually built support for a whole spate of gender equality legislation. Now, this is encouraging for us, but it poses a threat to more conservative forces who are still not reconciled, of course, with the idea of women's effective political voice. Um, so maybe a few comments about backlash before I end. Um, like most workplaces, the political workplace in Pakistan is designed to reinforce male hegemony. And that's what I wrote about in the article that you mentioned, Liz. Um, the reason is that most women who are in this space are there as token representatives of their sex, which puts them at a disadvantage. For example, political parties, they do have their own women's wings but these don't exercise decision-making power on policy. They are used really to bring in votes for male candidates. And most women in the elected assemblies are present as quota seat holders, not on general seats. They are indirectly elected by, male, by largely male decision-makers in their parties, so they begin their career as legislators, but without a public mandate. The assemblies present a hostile work environment. And in my research um, with women politicians, I heard stories about buildings with no toilet facilities, no rooms for the women's caucus to meet in, and a lot of trepidation about how and from whom to learn the rules and processes of parliamentary work. And I did a survey with women seat holders. About 200 women responded across all the assemblies of Pakistan. And more than a quarter said that they had experienced silencing, silencing by male colleagues. And almost a quarter said that they had received unwelcome messages or social media posts from their male colleagues. But on the rare occasion when a woman has spoken up publicly about sexual harassment, it has gotten very ugly indeed. Aisha Gulalai, some of you may have heard about, who was a quota seat holder from um, what is now the current ruling party. She charged her party leader, who is now prime minister, with harassment. But instead of a process of investigation, either by parliament or within the party, she was actually expelled from the party and expelled the end of her political career. So the dominant culture of the political workplace reluctantly accepts women's presence as long as they adhere to feminine norms, stay silent, dress well, exercise voice only in service of party politics, policies. As one senator told me, women feel that no matter what we do, we may get in trouble. And a feminist and former seat holder also said to me that I found because of the patriarchal setup, women started feeling very alone. Male leaders would mansplain and give us only a small space. And we constantly need to remind them that we exist. But exist they do and have achieved significant policy breakthroughs, which I'm not outlining here, but nonetheless, despite these obstacles, there have been breakthroughs. So today the debate is now moving on to other domains for affirmative action. For example, activists want quotas for women at decision-making levels in their political parties, and also more tickets to women on, uh, for election on general seats. So I'll end my comments here and I look forward to taking questions and maybe spelling out more details as the discussion goes on. Thanks, Liz. Thank you very much, Aisha. I think the whole issue about quotas, I'm sure that will come up again, but that's um, a really fascinating subject when it comes to women's representation. 
Um, so Sahela, moving on to you. So you've written about countering the backlash against gender equality. Can you tell us a little bit about what kinds of backlash women's movements are experiencing, particularly in, in South Asia? And also, has anything got worse or changed in any way over the past year with the pandemic? Uh, thank you, Liz. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel with such exciting and uh, inspiring women. Um, yes. So what we are noticing, and it's become more apparent over the years, is that the gains made on women, in women's rights and gender equality is facing a backlash. And the backlash is coming from different uh, forces, different actors, both from within the community that women belong to at different levels, but also from the state, uh, when the state uses particular types of law to clamp down on protests, silencing women, as we have seen. But um, it's also coming from, as we are seeing in South Asian countries, but also many other countries around the world, and I'm sure Teresa can add to this, is the rise of right-wing populist parties that have a very anti-gender uh, equality agenda, whether they use it for instrumental reasons to mobilize people or whether they believe actually on those gender norms is a different issue. But it is it has become very, very clear as they gain not just public space, but also ground in, in political institutions. And the backlash takes many different forms. So we are more aware about when it's direct, when it's in your face, right? So in a sense, direct assault on activists, physical assault. Uh, then of course, vilification of uh, gender equality activists, both online and offline using labels such as you're immoral, you're, you're an extremist, you're unpatriotic. Um, but apart from that, uh, there is also a use of court cases, it, court cases filed to harass you. And, and of course, delegitimizing of women's claims. So creating these counter myths, how gender equality is bad or you're bad for women's rights or your claims are somehow not um, not legitimate. So there are different direct strategies. So I'll give you a few examples. So for example, in Pakistan, uh, you have the Women's March or the Aurat March. And uh, this is organized by uh, uh, an intersectional uh, group of uh, feminists and women's organizations all across in Pakistan. But right now, uh, there are threats of anti-blasphemy charges against the activists. Uh, there are, of course, uh, online vilification of their activities and labeling of them in terms of how they're a danger to society and Pakistani state. So you can see the pressure they're under and what they're protesting is misogyny, harassment, they're claiming labor rights. Uh, so this is one, one kind of labeling. In India, we have also seen that. You have seen the anti-CAA protest, which is the Citizenship Act that India passed, which is very problematic, that excludes different sections of people. So when you had the Shaheen Bagh protests, these, these were peaceful sit-ins led by elderly Muslim women from the community protesting attacks on students and activists who have been detained and jailed, that there were five cases filed in Supreme Court to break down this uh, protest because it was seen as unruly. And these were peaceful grandmothers, you know, and you had an intersectional uh, a group of people coming and joining them. And of course, then when COVID hit, then it was about public health excuse to break it up. So you see these examples, but there are also backlash from the community, as I said. So in Nepal, you, we have examples of women human rights defender at the community level who work with survivors of uh, violence that they are facing AI attacks or So Hannah, you've You've just, I think we've lost, I don't know if it's just me, but I think we've lost Sahela for a second. Uh, I don't know how far you hear her. It, it was about the Nepali women human rights Nepal, defenders. Human rights uh, defenders, we, we lost you just as you started talking about Nepal human rights defenders. So if you could. Uh, sorry about that. So it's sort of, they are facing not just vilification about what they 
uh, their work, but they're also facing non-cooperation from the state officials, even though the state actually has a domestic violence act and wants these things addressed. Uh, we have also seen sort of pressure, for example, in terms of the High Court Directive on anti-sexual harassment, uh, that the directive that the universities need to implement in Bangladesh and how that has been sort of, there, this is a subtle form of backlash. You kind of hollow the provisions out or you don't implement and you foot drag as long as you can. You blame the victims, you blame the faculty members who are working with the students on these issues, you just make the provisions toothless. Or the state itself in South Asia using NGO registration laws for NGOs that receive foreign funding, or the Social Welfare Act to scrutinize and silence organizing in a specific way. And that affects women's rights organizations, of course. So there are many different forms. And as COVID hit, it became even more difficult to organize in the ways that we organize. But that doesn't mean that protests have stopped. Obviously, you do see people coming together, particularly on women's rights issues. And you do see intersectional alliances and activism by young people, which is where our hope lies, but I'm not going to say that it's it's getting easier. It's getting harder and we have to fight harder. So I'll stop there. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just, just listening to you and the whole thought about it's getting harder and it's just having to keep fighting. It's just absolutely exhausting. I mean, I you know, the, the women who are on the front lines of these things, it's just how they can have the energy to keep continuing. It just, yeah, just always staggers me. Hannah, on to you. So we've got some sobering statistics in the UK. So the number of women, women in parliament, no, the number of men outnumber women in parliament two to one in the UK. And women are still underrepresented in um, senior government positions, such as including the cabinet. What do you think are the biggest challenges for women entering politics now in the UK? And also the challenges of keep getting them there and keeping them there. And what is your party doing to try and counter the backlash? So thank you, Liz, and thanks for having me. I'm sorry I'm not Mandy Reid, but I'll do my best. Um, so I think there are multiple intersecting barriers to women entering and then staying in politics. The two I would say that really stand out to me and the party the most urgently is the treatment of women in politics. As we've heard, that's a problem in many places, but it is still a massive issue in the UK and um, that women are predominantly disadvantaged because they tend to take on the role of being primary carer and they have a more difficult position within the wider economy. So whilst the connection might not be immediately apparent, as long as women are economically unequal, and as long as the duties of care are unequally placed on women, entering into politics for those women is always going to be a privilege and not an opportunity. So leadership opportunities will continue to move away from women unless we fundamentally change the reality of both caregiving, the gender pay gap and childcare. So we need to, as a society, decouple gender from care um, because this will always impact on representation. And this isn't, this isn't a quick or flashy initiative. This is huge societal change I'm talking about. But it's the basics, it's the core of everything we do. And so it's one of our big priorities in the Women's Equality Party is looking at how we can transform our government and society's approach to caregiving in order to give women more options of what they want to do with their time and energy. Because at the moment, I think many, people, many women around the country don't feel they have that choice. Politics, I can tell you from personal experience, is demanding and it's expensive. And it's very time consuming. And that's primarily because it's designed to cater to men's lifestyles. It's designed to cater to people who do not have those additional responsibilities in the same way. So until we deal with the accessibility of politics and the additional expectations that society in the UK places on women, there are always going to be barriers that keep us out of the forefront of politics. So if we look right down at care itself, We've seen, particularly over the last year with the pandemic, the importance of care and 
frankly, the government's mishandling of the pandemic by underestimating the importance of care prior to this. So there were, I think, 112,000 social care vacancies in the UK before the pandemic even hit. This has been a massive issue and it's made things harder for us going through. Women, we know, do the majority of paid and unpaid care, and neither of those is valued or paid as it should be. So the average care worker earns around £8.50 an hour. A real living wage in London is around £10.80. We are not valuing care as much as we should as a society. And wherever those gaps are, wherever those 112,000 vacancies are, it's women that step in to fill those gaps which again impacts their ability to enter politics. If you've got all these other responsibilities, you can't then also try and become a politician. Childcare is being a, has been a massive issue and that has again been worsened by the pandemic. So one in four childcare providers are now estimating they may have to close by the end of this year. And if you are in a position where you are consumed both emotionally, physically and financially by having to find childcare when there are not enough spaces, then entering the political sphere is a complete world away from your day-to-day life. So these are all some of the reasons why politics is still for women a privilege rather than an opportunity. And that's kind of the key issue we have, I feel. Um, And then it you can't not talk about the fact that women in politics do experience more abuse. Um, So it's one of the most common reasons that women stand down from politics. So even the ones that have made it in don't tend to stay around very long because of the level of abuse we experience. Um, And there's, you know, articles after article after article talking about the sexist and misogynistic treatment that female politicians experience in the UK. And of course, this is then compounded by racism and xenophobia towards women. We know very well that Diana received more abuse than any other woman politician in the 2017 general election. And I think that exposes a very shameful part of our society that still feels threatened by seeing women, especially black women, in positions of power and influence. And we have to face up to that as a society. So finally, (laughs) <laughs> Your final part of the question was how we as a party um, counter the backlash. I think there are a few ways in which we do this. Firstly, we are very big on what we call political polyamory, where we like to work with other political parties. Our members are very much welcome to be members of other political organisations because we believe that we work better If we work together, politics works better for everyone if we talk to each other and don't just yell across the Houses of Commons at each other. Um, But also we have an incredible membership and incredible volunteers that give so much time and have created this phenomenal community of support. So whilst the backlash is there on social media in particular, in the media more widely, it becomes this kind of small background noise in comparison to the sheer wave of determination and support that we have within the party. So I think as women have come together to support each other within the organisation, that's really helped manage the backlash that we inevitably receive. Great, thank you, Hannah. That's that wave of determination. I I really like that. It's very strong, positive. Thing to end on on that bit. Um, But I think the issue around care is just so important and I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to to that later and it's that's you know absolutely been exposed by the the pandemic Uh, so Teresa on to on to you finally um so Brazil has the lowest number of women in national legislatures in Latin America which really surprised me um how have women been organized in to correct this and what has the backlash what backlash have they experienced what's what's it like for a woman to enter politics in Brazil Okay, thank you, Liz. Thank you, um, IDS, for the invitation. Well, yes, perhaps I give you a little bit of the background first. Um, we have seen in the last two decades a considerable increase in the number of women elected in parliaments of countries of Latin America. Today, countries such as Bolivia, Cuba, Mexico have around 50% of women in their par- national parliaments, but others such as Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Argentina have above 40%, and all the others between 20 and 40%. Uh, Now, Brazil, despite having a gender quotas policy for over two decades, stands last 
in terms of women elected in parliament. It has only 15% of women in parliament. And this percentage was only achieved in the last parliamentary election of 2018. Before that, the percentage had never been above 10%. So why is it? Do our neighboring countries are less uh, patriarchal than Brazil? We don't think so, yes? So what, what, what are the key reasons for that? And uh, well, first of all, um, I must say that political parties in Brazil did not comply. We have a quotas, gender quotas policy since 1998, but political parties did not comply with the 30% quota policy until 2014. So a long time, yes, after the quota was implemented. But even after they started to comply with uh, quotas, the number of women elected remained the same. Increasing female candidacies did not have an impact in the number of women elected. As I say, it was always, as I said, it was always below 10%. So, because in order to get elected, obviously, it's not only enough to increase the number of women candidates, but they must have resources to run their campaigns in the first place. So in Brazil, women run in elections in, uh, with much less money than men do. And because money is so critical in winning elections in Brazil, because we have an electoral system which operates with an open list of candidates, so campaigns are individualized and people can bring as much money as they manage to get. So and because women get so much less money, it becomes difficult for them to get elected. So people who don't have money in our electoral system, it's very difficult for them to get elected unless they are a footballer or someone who is very well known, yes. So until 2016, businesses was the main donor, yes. But after scandals of corruption that I'm sure you are aware of, um, it was forbidden, donation from businesses was forbidden in 2016 and a public electoral fund was created. This public electoral fund is transferred to political parties before election and they are in charge of distributing it to their candidates according to rules they themselves create and they don't obviously create room for women to participate in this decision-making process. And they don't also make these rules, um, uh, they don't publicize very well these rules, yes? So just before the election of 2018, women uh, in parliament with their allies in the judiciary and civil society appealed to the Supreme Court arguing that if there was a law that uh, women should have should be at least 30% of candidates. So that should also they should also be entitled to 30% of this public fund, yes. And the judicial court rule in their favor. So uh, but this new rule did not have an impact as expected because women were 30, 34% of the candidates in this election, but only, as I mentioned, 15% of them uh, got elected. And why is it? Well, this is for a few reasons, yeah. First of all, political parties use different tricks to try and avoid in transfer uh, transferring electoral funds to women according to the rules, yes. And um, obviously they did not transfer funds to women as they should. So sometimes, for instance, they transferred money to candidates, to female candidates, with the agreement that part of it should be sent back to them. They also uh, transfer resources at the very beginning of the campaign to women, but at the very end, 
sorry, at the very beginning to men, but at the very end to women. And what can women do if they get the results in the last week? How can they run a campaign in the last week? So sometimes they, they, uh, they run into trouble with the, the electoral justice for that, and they become in, ineligible in other elections. So obviously this is a big discouragement for women to carry on trying and getting elected, yes? So, um, so we have many, many, many troubles with related to the way that political parties do not comply with the, the regulations. So I would say the political parties are certainly the main gatekeepers in what concerns women entrance into politics in Brazil, but also the electoral justice is ineffective in the finding and applying penalties for law-breaking parties. Obviously, women have been struggling, as you asked, for decades through coordinated action to get more women elected. They have fought for changes in electoral uh, legislation related to quotas, to electoral financing. They have also been carrying out training for female candidates. And this has resulted in an increase in the last election, uh, local elections of 2020 from an, an increase from 13.5 to 16%, which is not really much, but some. And uh, we also have seen an increase in the number of black women and trans women elected. In some large cities, the most voted for candidates were black and trans women, such as cities such as Sao Paulo. For instance, we had that trans women getting the majority of, of votes. But also as a consequence, and just to finish, um, we have seen an increase in violence against women in politics in Brazil, and particularly against black women. They have been insulted through the internet. So they have received life-threatening messages because of their race and their ethnicity. And of course, I'm sure you are aware, only three years ago, Marielle Franco, a black, a black counselor from Rio de Janeiro, um, from a left-wing party was murdered and we still don't know who ordered the shooting. So this is, is, is very critical and is very important that we pay attention to that. But um, yes, yeah, so this is the bleak situation we are in in Brazil in terms of women, women's political representation and the backlash. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. That's really interesting. I just. We're going to um, just mention again that if you have any questions, please post them in the, the Zoom chat. Um, I've just got a, to get the ball rolling a question on quotas. Um, so obviously we've seen that maybe in Pakistan they've they've had some inroads. Brazil, it would it would maybe appear that they've maybe not been as successful as they could have been. Do they help or hinder the, the backlash if you're enforcing this? What you know. It, have we got to a point where we have to do something? We have to have quotas. Are they the, you know, um, the worst, the best, better kind of evil than than not having them? What what do we think about that? Maybe Aisha. Oh, thanks, thanks, Liz, for the question. Because of course, you know, um, it's it's there's probably a slightly different answer for every country about what is the best pathway to increase women's political voice. But we know that in Pakistan, for example, if we had not had a quota, we would not have had anywhere near 17% women in the legislative assemblies. And without that, we would not have had maybe certainly the kinds of laws, the new laws that we've had, but separate from the laws, because you can always argue that the implementation is weak and maybe the country wasn't ready for it. What women tell me who I've spoken to who have been in the assemblies is that their very presence has changed the culture of the, the floor of the house. Um, there's a backlash to that, there's resistance, but the very fact that a woman is in the room makes her presence credible and the state is backing her presence. And in a country like Pakistan, for example, where there's so much, um, so many forces that try to keep women out of the public domain, to have a state-backed initiative that insists on women's presence at this highest level is a very important signal. Um, so I think that quotas work on both explicit and also implicit um, cultural levels. So for us, it's been a very, very important step. Hela, have you got anything, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah. So um, do quotas help women? Yes, I think they do. Um, do they lead to a greater backlash? Lash? Oh, hells yes. Um, <laughs> because I think it's something very tangible that men and it is generally men will kind of leap onto as a this is a demonstration of everything that's wrong with getting women into politics. I was actually quite anti quota for a long time. And then I read um, this book by Jess Phillips, Every Woman, um, which is part of the reason I got into politics. And she writes so wonderfully about how all women shortlists were used by the Labour Party to get more women engaged in politics and unfortunately whilst I wish it wasn't the case I think it is something we need at present because we are in a situation where we have 22 percent of the cabinet that's female in the UK in 2021 and until we start making real tangible efforts to change that it's not going to improve so but yes I think it is something that whenever quotas are mentioned you do see a massive backlash against them and that can be quite difficult to manage Hella, did you have any thoughts on quotas? If you can, then if you can hear us, Sahela. Sorry, my computer is acting up. Uh, yes, um, in terms of quotas, obviously you can argue for and argue against, right? But you have to think historically where women are based and how they are coming in. And we, as Aisha pointed out, in a lot of contexts, women will not be there or what Hannah pointed out in terms of the uh, all women lists to get women in. I mean, you need a foot in the door. And how do you get a foot in the door if the political culture is very male centric and all the institutions are very male dominated and you're not part of the old boys networks and political parties don't think you can win seats and voters don't think you're great leaders. So you need inroads. We can argue against like who comes in and what happens and what's the nature of the quota. How you design the system matters in terms of who picks up skills and who comes in and how do you protect people who come in so that they are able to exercise their voice. Um, but you don't stop people from coming in. You, you absolutely need mechanisms to get in. And once women are in, there is the, the, the things change, they change slowly, but I'll tell you a very interesting story why it's important to see women in power. Um, um, and this is not directly related to CODA, but it's definitely related to dynastic politics. Um, so my country, Bangladesh, has had female prime ministers since 1991. That's how it's happened. It's either this party or that party. And you can argue the merits, demerits of the prime ministers. Uh, my nephews were born much after 1991, but all their lives they have seen female leaders in power. So one of them, who was eight at the time, asked that in Bangladesh, do you think only females could be prime ministers? Because he has never seen a man in prime ministerial position, and that is called demonstration effect. Our perceptions need to see, change, and if we don't see it, we don't believe it. And one of the ways of seeing it is through quotas. So uh, I would say, yes, we absolutely need them for a limited time, but we do need them. That's, that's an incredible story. I, I like that about, yeah, can men be prime ministers or, politi or politicians? Well, maybe. I like that. Um, I've got a question that's come by YouTube. Um, so how can women from lower social economic backgrounds be protected, um, especially with their increase in political participation in, in, in religious and political environments that do not particularly protect them? So any thoughts on, I mean, in a way, it's a sense of you know, if we have quotas, who are getting these, these, you know, getting on the lists? Are these kind of people from representing everyone? So how, you know, if you're from a lower social background, are you less likely to seek office? How, you know, with, how do we protect them? Any thoughts, Hannah? Um, so I think that parties have a lot of responsibility on this one, actually, about who we choose as candidates and how we then support them going forwards. Because, as I said earlier in my um, moment, um, it is really important that as organisations we gather together in, and work as a kind of cohort with this wave of determination, because I think unless we do that, politics is a very, very lonely place 
particularly at the moment when we're all kind of doing everything via Zoom. Um, and there's a lot of kind of online abuse coming our way. So I think it is a big problem trying to ensure that we um, make politics accessible and supportive for everyone, particularly those from lower socioeconomic classes. Um, one of the things we did really effectively, I think, was um, in our last general election campaign, our entire uh, campaign was based around ending violence against women and girls and the fact that sexual harassment in Parliament itself was so prevalent. So we ran five candidates who were all survivors of domestic abuse and violence against five MPs who had been accused of similar offences. And that was really powerful because I think these were women who, if you ask them themselves, they'd never have envisaged themselves going into politics, but we made the conscious effort to give them as much of a platform and as much support as we could. So we could show them and other young women that there is no barrier, there should be no barrier to going into politics as a woman, whatever your background, whatever your lived experience. Um, so I think we need parties and organisations to continue to do that, to start like actively finding these women and asking them, because we know um, there's loads of research that says it, it, you have to ask a woman to stand or to contest five times before she will take part in an election. That's not the same for men. Um, so I think it's about asking and actually asking again and again and again, as well as making it a supportive environment. Thank you, Hannah. Teresa, have you got anything to add on protecting and supporting women from particularly lower um, economic backgrounds? Okay, I think we have a different uh, electoral, yes, our electoral system is different. So just going back to your first question, I think quotas work much better in electoral, in proportional representation with closed list. So someone just mentioned that political parties uh, do not um, select women to, you know, do not have women in their list. Sometimes they don't put women uh, higher up in the list, and that's a big problem. But in Brazil, we have an open list. So, you know, so quotas is really important. I believe that quotas is very important because otherwise we wouldn't have had even 15% what we have in Brazil. But concerning um, poor women or uh, it's, it's because this electoral system is open list and everyone can bring to their campaign uh, well, there is a ceiling there, but the ceiling is too high. So if people manage to bring too much money to their campaign, how can a candidate who is not well connected with don donors, yes, and who do not get money from these public funds available, manage to get elected if they are poor? What we see is like my data show that women from all the money brought into the campaigns by candidates only 9% uh, uh, were related to, to women. So if we have 34, we had 34% of women candidates, it means that women brought into their own campaign much less money because obviously I think they anticipate that it's gonna be really difficult for them to, to win campaign. So in that sense, it's difficult for women to poor women to get elected, obviously. But what's happening in Brazil, and I think perhaps that's something very important to mention, what happened is that women now create a kind of what they call collective mandate. They get together and they run as a group of candidates. So sometimes three, five women, six women, they get together and they run as a, and they campaign as a group. And one of them obviously have their name and their name on the, on the list, but all of them actually are the ones responsible for the mandate. So they are kind of creating new strategies in, in order to survive in this exclusivist um, political and electoral system. But yes, it's, it's, it's hard, it's much harder for women and particularly for black and poor women. Yeah, that's really interesting, the collective mandate. I think that's really interesting. And um, we've got another question from um, Joy Lynn, um, quite a, a general question. How did feminisms, feminists, women in power become a target for patriotism, um, patriotists and nationalisms to achieve their political goals? So. I guess kind of why are women used as this political football? Why, you know, how did this happen? General question, who wants to start with a ball rolling with that one? Aisha. 
So again, of, of course, it's context specific, but in Pakistan, you have the more nationalist and right wing forces are also um, the ones who are keen to use religion as part of the national ideology. So then it works very well when women are feminists and they're coming on the streets and they're using rights based language to um, paint them with the brush of being um, anti state and representing foreign interests. And I think that um, this brush of uh, that women get painted with that they represent Western fund Western funded NGOs and Western funded agendas in Pakistan has really been extremely damaging and it's gone very well into it's played very well into the camp of the religious right and the more conservative forces. So even when we had a political party that was led by Nawaz Sharif that wasn't a religious right party, they still were very conservative and they were very happy to paint um, women's activists and their NGOs as this foreign agent um, element. And I think that kind of legacy has continued until today. So no matter which government is in power, we struggle with that. So Hala, do you want to jump in? Yes. So uh, it, again, I agree with Aisha, it's context specific, but then it has certain elements that are quite common. So you have to sort of think about women's rights agenda and how entitlement that women have is created and how what's the history of that. So in the UK, obviously, after First World War and Second World War, certain kinds of because of women kept the society and economy going at that time. The entitlements that you can claim and the history of women's movement affects how, what's the perception of how you see the issue. Even if political institutions are male dominated and in, in the seventies, like you had a lot of changes in the law. So it, it took a while, right? But in other parts of the world, the trajectory is different. So they, the, for developing countries, when you became independent, there's the sort of the debate around modernization and how you see women's role in a modern society. So there are, there are tensions around that, but because not everyone agrees or signs up onto that. And on top of that, then when you see rise of certain kinds of agenda, particularly right-wing populist agenda, that paints women in sort of this, uh, in, in the traditional roles, right, and, and glorifies that, um, you, you have an agenda to push that brings people together, partly when you're facing economic crisis, male breadwinning role is under. You've just, you've just cut out again, Sahela. Oh, God. So I'm, I was saying, I was basically saying, I don't know how much you heard. I was saying with the rise of right-wing populist sort of parties, it's easier to fan or use gender equality as the scapegoat for all your problems. So men can't earn uh, enough or there there are insecurities and unemployment. You can fan those by saying, oh, it's the women who are, who are the problem or women need to stick to this. So yes, we want women to participate in the labor markets, but then it's about cultural issues and our culture doesn't support reform of family laws that would give, a, give equal inheritance rights or equal citizenship rights. And you have these, and partly because a lot of the women's movement, I mean, you have uh, sort of community-based mobilization and you also have autonomous movements, but you also have a lot of the work in developing countries goes on with development funding. So it's easier to paint as this is a foreign imperialist agenda. It's not our agenda, even though there's a history of working on those issues. So it's, 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 a, it's a glue that holds a lot of anti-actors together. And you become, as you said, Liz, a football for everyone to kick, you know, and 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 sort of uh, push their own own sort of uh, interests and agendas forward. So it's it's a it's a tough field in that sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hannah, uh, Teresa, do you want to Hannah? Do you want to come in? Um, yeah, thank you. So. I think one of the challenges we've seen, particularly in the last few years, is the kind of rise of soundbite politics. If it doesn't fit in 280 characters or into a snappy little TikTok video, then people aren't interested, is at least how it's kind of portrayed. And I think because a lot of the things that women in politics are talking about that have not been talked about for decades around care and the role of women in society, these are complex things. We are trying to unpick 
centuries of inequalities here. And we are trying to shine a spotlight on a lot of invisible work and a lot of things that people just don't talk about. Because frankly, care is not sexy. Like a lot of the stuff we're talking about is not going to grab headlines. Social care workers don't get paid enough. That is, that's not a story to many people. Whereas, you know, someone like Lawrence Fox will come along, have one stint on question time, call a white woman a racist. And lo and behold, he's now like running for mayor of London and doing all this stuff and getting massive donations um, into his movement. And that's because he operates in this land of soundbite politics. And I think because a lot of the time, if women have managed to make the journey into the political sphere, which as we've discussed is hugely challenging because of all of the societal stuff in the background, once we've got there, we've got some serious work to be getting on with, and none of that fits into 280 characters. So I think it's very easy to put us down and like ignore us because the work we're trying to do is so complex and intricate, as opposed to walking in going, I'm going to put statues everywhere. Great. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Hannah. Teresa, did you want to come in on, on that? On that uh -huh. issue? Yes, I just, I just wanted to comment a bit on uh, uh, the fact that we have now in la the last parliament was the majority of, of candidates elected were... Um, were from the right wing. So Hila mentioned before, we have Bolsonaro as the president and also more than 50% of, of candidates that managed to get elected were from the right wing, including women. Uh, a little bit less for women because obviously for left wing parties tend to elect more women than right wing parties, yes. So what we see there is that we have, um, we had, uh, have women that do uh, do put forward an agenda for women's rights, but there are also a backlash within the women's group as well, you know, and we have, and that is, is, uh, is kind of complicates the story, yes, because what people say sometimes is that what's the, what's the use of having more women in parliament if we then don't have um, women who, go, who, are, who are for women's rights and, and so on. So, but obviously I do think it's really important that we have more women respectively of what, what they do, because I do think that um, more, uh, it's easier for women to represent women's interests, but also they bring a different perspective to different issues, uh, you know, to different uh, topics, not just women's issues. So that's is critical. But um, uh, yes, I just wanted to comment on how sometimes it becomes more difficult and the backlash is even harder because of the kind of what the, the political configuration that we have there, and in particularly, particularly now that we have a right-wing um, candidate in government and um, a, a right-wing um, parliament, more uh, you know, majority of people there, right? So it's kind of uh, it's been difficult to, and we have in a backlash, for instance, concerning a lot of of issues related to to um, sexual rights, to um, abortion, you know, they're trying to restrict legislation that are, are always so restrictive, yes? So, so I just wanted to bring those, to complicate a little bit more this, the, the situation. That's great. Actually, just following up on one of your one of your, the points you've made, and um, someone has just asked a question: Is that should we differentiate between women in political power and protecting women's rights in society? So they use the example of the UK, which has had two um, women prime ministers. And they're not particularly known for supporting women's rights, or you know, social the social economic or care factor or anything like that. They haven't. They haven't sort of. They're not perceived, I would say, as women that have been very kind of pro-womanism in their policies. Um, what what is how do we? I don't know. I don't want to say get the right women in because is it, is it important that, as you were saying, Teresa, that we get women in there at, to get a women's perspective on every single issue? Why you know should we expect women to just focus on women's issues when they're in a political space? Hannah, I'm going to go to you first, just because you know it's it's a UK aspect on this particular question. 
Yeah. So I think it's a really, really important point. Um, and I'm regularly in events where I kind of get, yes, but the Conservative Party have had two female prime ministers. And you're just like, great, what have they done for women? And you just kind of hear no- nothing, nothing. Um, so I think it is it is really important that we do make the distinction. I think a key element of this is about volume. It's very hard as one woman in politics to actually make change for other women. And because it's so hard for women to get into politics in the first place and then through to the very highest levels, there's this kind of assumption within the system that the ones who do are going to behave in an almost masculine way. They are going to demonstrate what we consider to be stereotypical masculine traits in order to fight their way up which I think is emblematic of the problems we have in politics, that it should never be a fight in the first place. But it's kind of like you're expected to get your elbows out and really wade yourself in. And to do that, again, if you talk about things that primarily affect women, you are not going to be invited into the room where it happens. You are not going to be in that 22% of the cabinet that's female. And so I think it's almost people who do make it in are almost dissuaded from talking about these issues. I don't think that women should only be doing politics that affect women. In fact, a lot of my argument would be if we sort out things like universal childcare and care the care sector in general and ending violence against women and girls that has huge benefits for everyone this does not just stop with that 52 percent of the population it actually has a massive benefit for men if we do all of these things so i think firstly we need to move away from the idea that certain things are women's problems because they're not a lot of us are going to need social care regardless of our gender Um, and that is a problem for men as well but also we need to look at how we get enough women in that you're able to talk about this stuff in politics because I think at the moment if you want to get to the top you just can't be seen to do this because you will be silenced. That's really interesting. Does anyone we've got about five minutes left I just wonder if there's anyone else that wants to, to come in on this particular point? Yes, because I teach this. <laughs> uh, and, and I agree with Hannah. Uh, there are, uh, and Teresa, so a few things here. One, you need to see women in power. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of the two conservative prime ministers that UK had. I'm not the biggest fan of my prime ministers in Bangladesh, but it's important to see women in power, whether they act for you or not. So that's one point. Uh, Second is we don't judge the men in terms of, oh, do they promote men's interests? What do they do, et cetera? We judge them on policy. So why is it that when it comes to women, then we are so crabby about what is it that they're doing? Judge them on their merits of their policy, okay? Because they're politicians, they're running to win. So they will do whatever it takes. If an issue is controversial and politically costly, you're asking them not to be elected again if they're backing it up. When do they back it up? A, when they have the numbers, you need coalitions inside parliaments, inside governments. It's always about deal making. We may not like deal making in democracy, but you need to trade. If I support you for this, will you support me for that? If you don't have the numbers, you're not going to get it. So numbers, but the numbers are not the only thing. i there's this fantastic research by Tun and Weldon and they look at 70 countries and they use regression analysis because we are always suspicious of anecdotal data, right? And so in that data, what they show, what matters is having women inside the state, but women who are also connected to autonomous feminist movements. Again, autonomous feminist movements because you have a constituency, you have the backing and you have that kind of identity and interest to back up feminist agendas, right? Despite that, of course, politics is a, it, it's a long game. You're not going to see changes just like that. But that doesn't mean, I mean, of course, you need to differentiate between which woman comes in and who would back certain issues and interests. But we also need men on board because the issues are not just women's issues. So what makes us critical actors to support the changes, the transformative changes that we want to see that would benefit the society and economy as a whole. That's great. That's yeah. Can I just say a little, yeah. just to compliment a little bit. I agree with Sohila 
And uh, but also would like to say that in Brazil, most of the legislation in favor of women, particularly related to uh, the political empowerment of women, quotas, political finance, have been uh, pushed by women, have been articulate, have been coordinated by women. So even if we cannot essentialize, we cannot say that women are always, you know, the best defenders of women's rights. There is a tendency for women to, it's more easier for women to kind of to legislate for women in these areas in particular, in terms of um, uh, political empowerment of women, but also in other areas. So I think it's critical, as Olivia said, that we increase the number of women and uh, irrespectively of what women, obviously, but then we have to, we prefer obviously that these women are feminist left-wing women and so on, but then we have to uh, kind of fight for that, yes, as activists and as feminists. Great, we are almost, very almost out of time. So I'm, I'm just gonna go to Aisha for a final point and a, a nice easy question. How do we change the status quo, whether that's in politics or wider, so it's better for women? Easy question. Oh, easy question. Two, <laughs> two, two easy answers. One is that autonomous feminist movements are so important in each and every country that we've ever looked at. And um, they're the ones who drive the change and they're the ones that spell the agenda. So securing our movements is really important. And the second thing is that, you know, um, I'm a great believer that in countries like ours, the state has to have um, a reform agenda and has to lead a kind of um, gender equality agenda to lead from the top and pressure from us at the bottom. Otherwise it's not going to happen because in between the political forces are too entrenched in um, very uh, conservative agendas. Wonderful. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for everyone that that um, that attended. And sorry, we didn't get to your questions. And um, I know they're in the chat, so maybe there's um, a way of answering some of them later. But just thank you so much for the the wonderful panelists, for Hannah, for Sahela, for Teresa, and for Aisha. Um, it's been really so interesting. I just find it fascinating. We could go on and talk all afternoon. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time. Um, and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Thank you.